five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. When I was, when I was a kid in school and the teacher would ask us uh, you know, to pick a book when, when it wasn't assign a book time, it was pick a book time. I always went for the biographies. Even the, Remember when you would order like books and you the, the books would come into the class and it would be like you ordered 10 books. Oh, and the, the Weekly Reader Club. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I always liked the books that were about somebody's life. You know, I don't know why. It was just always, maybe that's why I do, I do a talk show now. I get to meet people and learn about them. Uh, Gerald Moore is on the phone. He has a book called Life Story, The Education of an American Journalist. And in his case, the word life is all capitalized because he actually was a journalist with Life Magazine. How about that? An award-winning journalist at that. He uh, was a bureau chief, an editor, a contributor to People Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, Reader's Digest, Families, Horticulture. He's a speechwriter for three agricultural commissioners and Governor Mario Cuomo. Is he in New York? I don't know. And he's retired uh, public information officer for the New York State Department of Agriculture. Wow, we would have not something in common in that regard, but I speak to the... <laughs> but, but I mean, I speak to our uh, public information officer at the ag thing up in Tallahassee. Yes. Down here. Uh, Gerald Moore, good morning, Gerald. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Are you in New York right now? I'm, no, I'm actually in North Carolina. We, we have, a, we have a, a winter place in North Carolina where we uh, escape the northern snows. Oh, yes, and I heard it was snowing in Boston this morning. Uh, yes, and, and, and we're having a beautiful day in Chapel Hill. So. <laughs> oh, good. We're, ha we're having a beautiful day in Florida, too. So uh, well, well, thank you for being on the air with us today. Uh, I mean, your, your credentials are enough to give us information that we could just pick your brain all day long. But it, you decided to write your memoir, and you focused on the life part of it, at least for the title, right? Yes. Well, I, I spent uh, the, the last uh, a number of years of my of my active uh, journalism career was at Life Magazine, uh, which it, it was the period which I, I sort of call the supernova period. It, it burned brightly, and then it burned out. It you know it folded in 1972 as a weekly magazine. But it was a great ride up to that point. It was the magazine that that pulled you in because of the photography and kept you in because of the writing. Well, I think that's very true. That's a, that's a good way to put it. You know, the the photo essay was actually uh, uh, I, I don't know whether it's right to say it was invented by Life, but the first photo essay I think ever done probably appeared in Life, and um, it it took photography to a place that it had never been before. So it was uh, it, it, for for probably twenty years. If you wanted to see what was going on in the world, you really had to look at Life magazine. There was no TV, and uh, you know that you could see a, maybe a picture in a newspaper. Right, right. I, w I would venture to say this is just a guess. I didn't try this, but if we were to use today's technology and in the Google search for uh, images, if we simply put pictures from the nineteen sixties, I bet you a, a good half of them are from Life magazine. I think that's true. Uh, the Life Archives is enormous, and of course they continue to uh, to exploit those by doing various, uh, you know, books on World War II or mm -hmm. books on the Beatles or what have you. Yeah, the Beatles always show up, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So, so tell me about what some of the most uh, colorful memories you have working with Life. Well, I I I think the the first big story I did for Life was on LSD, and this was in the in the '60s, and it was before people generally knew anything about LSD. I mean, they they uh, the uh, younger people, kids in California, knew about it, but uh, and and I guess a few a uh, few academics knew about it, but no one else did. Uh, but it was about to to, to take off. It was uh, it was so legal. And um, a, a photographer in uh, in Los Angeles uh, sort of got onto this, and there were some pretty hip people in New York who knew about it. And uh, so my bureau chief said, you know, go find out about LSD. And and what I found out was uh, was astonishing because, um, as I said, uh, you, you know, it, it, when a lot of people start doing something they haven't done before, it's mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so what was the attitude? I mean, now we we think of LSD, we think of drugs, and we kind of. I mean, uh, 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 it's like you know, yeah. it's like a you know zombie coming near us or something, mm -hmm. and and as it should be, I think. But back in those days, it was. It, I remember because I mean, I never did it, but I would read, you know, from my favorite rock and roll stars and whatever mm -hmm. the people I like. Because I'm 61, just so you get a reference point there. But I re I remember reading about it. It was like uh, John Lennon and, uh, and whoever else was doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. it, they, they just treated it like it was. Uh, I don't know. It was it was not considered an important thing. Right. Well, when I first when I first uh, got onto it, in, in uh, I mean, I didn't take it either. But when I first found out about it, uh, 
you know, they were making enormous claims for it. It was going to change human nature. It was going to end war. Everybody was going to live in peace and uh, and love. And uh, it was just uh, considered a miracle drug. Isn't it that wild for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, uh, reporting back then on all of the uh, things that were going on in the world from uh, uh, sports to uh, music to art to politics, uh, everybody tried to be as accurate as they can, but still being as courteous as they can. Yes, yes. Um, I, I didn't. I'm sure I didn't quite understand the question. I was uh, there was a little noise on my phone. But could you just re- repeat the the question? Oh, certainly. Uh, when Life Magazine first came about, it seemed that people, when they covered events and things. Um, and they and and they uh, uh, wrote about it. They were more courteous about just writing about the event and the person. And now it's like, how much dirt can you dig up on somebody and not really report a story? You're absolutely right. You know, life was uh, people loved life. They would love. They would welcome us if we showed up to do a story. They would say, "Oh God, the guys from Life Magazine are here." And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was it was wonderful because uh, there were times, of course, when we people knew we were we were looking into things that they shouldn't have done, and they weren't so friendly. But mostly, uh, life got along really well with the people that it uh, covered. Let me ask you a question. I don't think I've ever spoken to somebody who actually wrote for um, People magazine before, and I've always had a question about something. I hope this isn't too much of a curveball, because, of course, we want to be fair to the book, uh, which is, of course, called Life Story. But in the movie uh, The Big Chill, you probably know where I'm going to go already with this, right? I I think Jeff Goldblum's character is a writer for People magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So you know where I'm going with this, where he kind of puts down his own job. He he says, well, I have to be able to write stuff that people can read while they're sitting on the toilet. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I I hate to disparage any any magazine, but I I think that uh, my own view is that in terms of quality of journalism, People was an enormous step down from the other magazines that Time Inc. published. I mean, it was not Time, it was not Fortune, it was not Sports Illustrated. It made, it made and continues to make enormous amounts of money, but it, it's, uh, it, it panders to a certain taste, I right. think. Right, 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 right. Uh, you worked with a few different photographers and seemed to get along very well. And there was one story that we were told about when uh, you were interviewing Pope Paul the Sixth, and you thought that you and your photographer got a great cover shot. Oh well, we yeah. So it was when the Pope came to New York, and I think it was the first time that a Pope had come to America. And uh, so we, we did an elaborate uh, coverage, the magazine did. I think we had 25 photographers, uh, and we photographed the Pope from the mo- time that he got up in the morning in his quarters in the Vatican until he until he re- returned there that night. I think it was a 20-hour trip, something like that. But I was stationed, uh, I had two positions. One was across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral. And when the Pope arrived at St. Patrick's to say Mass, he he got out of his limousine, he walked up to the front of the door and turned around and waved, and I said, that's got to be a cover, the Pope in, in front of St. Patrick. Yeah, right. uh, later that night, uh, I went out to Yankee Stadium where he said Mass to, I don't know, maybe 100,000, uh, I don't know how many people were there, but it was packed. And um, and the the next day I said, you know, what did they choose for the cover? Well, they, the cover they chose was the Pope at Yankee Stadium. That says the Pope in America better than probably anything else. Okay. Wow. That makes sense, doesn't it, when you think about it, right? Of course. Yeah, it, I mean, the, uh, people around the world have seen the Pope in front of a lot of cathedrals. They haven't seen him in Yankee Stadium. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, let's take a little break, and, and we'll do more com- of this conversation on the other side. The book is called Life Story, The Education of an American Journalist. Gerald Moore is our guest, and he's the author of the book. Is that you on the cover? Uh, yes, it is. And yeah, the, uh, and, uh, younger and more vigorous, but uh, yes, that's me. <laughs> An upside down. Uh, I got to hear the story of that upside down uh, phone booth there. Yes, All right, with well, the don't, shopping cart. Well, let's do it on the other side. We got to take a break. We got weather, and then we'll be right back. I can't wait. We'll be right back. Okay. The weather is brought to you by myfwc.com. Safe boating is no accident this Monday. Times of clouds and sun during the morning hours, then mostly sunny and pleasant in the afternoon with a high of 78 to 82. It'll be mainly clear Monday night and cool, low 51 inland 59 along the coast. 
Tuesday will be a nice day with sunshine, high 77 along the coast, 83 inland. The Wednesday, partly sunny, the high 75 at the coast, 80 inland. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Career Source Citrus Levy Marion brings together business and community partners, economic development leaders, and educational providers to connect employers with qualified, skilled talent, and job seekers with employment and career development opportunities. Tune in the first and third Wednesday of each month at 9.30 a.m. to Career Source Citrus Levy Marion and learn how they can help you. That was the sound of a tree falling. It could be your tree. You're going to have it trimmed, but never got around to calling Pride Tree Service. It could have fallen in a field, and now all you have to do is call Pride Tree Service, and they'll have it quickly out of the way for a great price. But don't wait until the tree falls. It may not fall in the field. It may hit your car, your house, or worse. So call Pride Tree Service today and avoid all those headaches before they happen. Pride Tree Service, 840-0750. That's 840-0750. Hi, this is Brad. I want to take a moment to talk about a serious issue. In the next five years, the aviation industry is projected to have a shortage of commercial pilots. Now is the time to start training. Ocala Flying Club has started a scholarship for the youth of Marion County ages 17 to 24. The club will donate up to $4,000 towards a pilot's license. This will help get the student on their way to obtain their commercial pilot license. If this sounds like something you would be interested in, or if you know someone that would be, please contact Ocala Aviation Services, 861-7484. All right, 17 minutes after. 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Gerald Moore is on the phone, and uh, his book is called Life Story, The Education of an American Journalist. Fascinating uh, look into the, the, the world. that there, It parallels our world a little bit, and I wanted to ask a question, Gerald, about that. We, we're obviously in the small time, and you were in the big time, and we're in radio, and you were in print. But there's, this, there's one thing I'm, I'm thinking we have in common, and that is when you have somebody who feels like they were not put into a flattering light. Maybe it's because of a question that was asked or because of a, uh, in our case, sometimes we have video of, of them if they're in the studio. So d did that ever create a problem where somebody said, you gotta take that picture off the map? How would they even know? I mean, it's not like today's technology where you could get it off the website. Well, it, at live, uh, we did run into that problem, of course, and 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 some people have enormous egos, and so they, right. you know, they, they ne there was never a picture that was quite good enough to, to represent them. Um, but w what we did usually was we we edited the magazine in great secrecy, <laughs> so that uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. people didn't usually know what picture was going to appear until the the magazine was on on the street. There were a few people who would demand um, uh, and get, I think, probably approval of photographs that were going to be on the on the cover, like Elizabeth Taylor, let's say. Uh, the the deal would be if you want me on the cover, you got to let me uh, have uh, some control over what picture you use. But uh, we, we, we worked with that, but mostly we took, uh, I think we took the high road and, and, and did what we thought we should do. Right, right. And, and in, in political uh, inst instances, uh, again, the similarity between what you do and what we do, it's kind of hard to, well, it's easy to be neutral, but it's hard to show that you're neutral. I mean, usually something comes out, you know? Well, I think that I, I thought about this a lot, and I thought about it a lot when I was working at Life, and I, I don't think that anyone, everybody's got a point of view. You just do. That's the way it is. Uh, you're, you know, you're raised with certain attitudes, and you have a point of view. I think what you have to do is try to be transparent about this and, and, and respectful of the facts. And I think if you, if you tell people how you know things, how you got the information, and you give them the information, then I think you've done your job. But yeah, yeah. For, as far as the readership is concerned, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you you were talking about the uh, uh, blackout that happened along the eastern seaboard in uh, New York, and how the larger radio stations uh, could function, like WABC, because they had uh, oh, backup uh, generators. But you were in a building with others, and you did such a cool thing using grease pencils. No. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I had just moved to New York from New Mexico, and as as I said in the book, I, I was used to the power going out. It, it, you know, we had power outages, <laughs> you know, like people do. But in, in New York, you know, they didn't have power outages, and so it was when the lights started to flicker, 
at about six o'clock. I said, "Oh, I think we're going to lose the power," and everybody looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. You know, <laughs> this, this, this hick, you know. And That's one of the funny. people actually said, uh, "Gerald, the lights don't go out in New York. We're, <laughs> we're fun, you know, the lights went out in New York." <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> so you know, we're on the thirtieth floor in a in a dark dark building, and the elevators are not running. And eventually, oh, no. we. we uh, we collected. We first we burned all the birthday candles that were left over from people's birthdays. But <laughs> no. then to get out of the building, we actually collected all the uh, grease pencils we could find and and uh, light, lighted them one by one as we walked down the stairs. <laughs> and they, you know, they're they're noxious and smoky, but they they we got we got out of the building. <laughs> where was where was the life building in this in the city? It was on it was on Sixth Avenue uh, on Fifty uh, Second and Sixth. Oh, okay. And, uh, okay. Yeah, it, you know, I think they've moved now to the new Time Life Center up on uh, Columbus Circle, but uh, for for a long time they were in Rockefeller Center. So what's the story on the cover? What happened to that phone booth? Why is it upside down? <laughs> well, that was taken during the Detroit, uh, Detroit riot in 1967, and uh, uh, I was walking down the street. It, you know, things were pretty chaotic. It, a lot of things had been torn up, and... I looked in, in this alley, and there's this upside-down phone booth with the phone ripped out. And I thought, well, this, this really kind of says it all, you know, uh, what's going on here. And I just stepped in the phone booth and picked up the phone and was looking at it. And a photographer that was with me took that, took that picture. And I kept it on my office wall for all these years. And when I wrote the book, I realized it was probably a great cover photograph. You know what's interesting is that Life magazine, to me, represented pop culture. I mean, as much as it did, you know, serious news as far as political things, but pop culture seems to come to mind a lot. And Life magazine itself was part of pop culture. So in, in a way, you were representing it and were part of it. You know, I think Life did a wonderful job of balancing between the two. They, on the one hand, they certainly were a part of popular culture. I mean, they, there was one point when uh, the magazine sold 13.5 million copies a week. So that's got to be popular culture. Yeah, sure, sure. At the same time, they, the magazine felt a, an obligation, I think, to tell people things that they thought they should know. And, and so, you know, they would do stories on... Uh, on Broadway musicals, they would also do stories on opera. Um, they would do stories on uh, on a birthday party, but they would also do stories on a great building that needed to be saved someplace. Mm. So they balanced that pretty well, I think. How, how much of a role do you feel Life magazine played in the civil rights movement? Do you do you think because of the imagery? Because again, I can picture the images mm -hmm. uh, of what was going on in those years, and I'm guessing that. In my mind's Google, I have, a, I have a Google in my mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm picturing, the, I'm imagining that the pictures that I'm remembering are probably from Life magazine. Well, they are. A lot of them are. And, and there are some really iconic pictures. I mean, I think we all remember the picture of the man, the African-American man with a dog, you know, right up in his face uh, on a short leash. And yes, a, yes. A trooper. Yeah, that, you know, that's an unforgettable image. And that, uh, a, a lot, a, along with a lot of others, appeared in Life uh, of course, I, I have to be honest. I have to say that television was around by that time, and so I think the TV news had a had a big impact on it too. Mm -hmm. But was I remember being I remember being absolutely shocked, sitting in you know thinking, "This is America. This still goes on in 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 our country." You know, it, I, it was I was ignorant of that somehow. And with your background as a uh, uh, police officer, and then you went uh, from being involved on the streets into uh, reporting things and then in your other capacity as an editor you wore many different hats and was it hard to separate them all i'm sorry what was the last thing you said that oh was it hard to uh uh, se uh to separate everything in your life because you were a, a police officer and then you were a uh um, well, a reporter and then an editor and it seems like three different entities I think uh, the first editor I worked for at the newspaper said, uh, he surprised me by saying, I think that policemen and reporters do a lot of the same things. They investigate things and write reports. Yes. And I was pretty surprised to hear him say that. But then I thought about it, it's true. And uh, there's a lot of, I mean, obviously a journalist don't arrest people, but uh, as far as investigating and trying to understand what's going on, they certainly do a lot of the same things that... Um, that law enforcement and regulators do. 
Um, we we do the news here obviously a lot, and we borrow or steal from from print <laughs> ju- from print journalists, and we've been doing it a long time actually. But but I've often noticed too, and we and we actually in our case, Robin, in my case, we really don't keep that a secret. I mean, everybody knows we we identify the source all the time. But I wanted to say that, um, and I'm just curious if just if you agree that journalism now almost always comes with some built-in slant, some built-in, you know, opinion that it may just be uh, subtle with the use of a certain adjective, for example. And th- that was always avoided, it seems like, back in the older days of journalism. I, I, I do. Th- I think you're right. I mean, I, I think that there is more, um, more opinion, more slant in, in, in a lot of writing now. And I'm not sure why that's happened. Um, um, but I do think that, that cable TV may have had something to do with that because, you know, cable is sort of tailored to, you, you can have a channel that, that expresses your views, whatever they are, you know, left, right, center, whatever. There's a channel for you, and it only feeds your prejudices. And uh, I think that newspapers maybe have um, t- tried to pick up on that a little bit and, to, you know, to be appeal to... Uh, a, a certain uh, point of view. I, I, I think it's a bad thing, but I Did I also think that generally speaking, you know what you're reading. You know, if I read um, if I read a newspaper, I generally know where they're coming from, at least to some degree. So I can kind of discount some right. of the some of their stuff. Did you become friends with any of the people who you were assigned to cover? Did you kind of bond with any anybody at all during the years? Uh, I can't say that I do, you know. Uh, um, I mean, a lot of the people that I covered when I was um, working at Life Art were quite a bit older, and so I'm sorry to say a lot of them are not here anymore, mm-hmm. like, you know, Gene McCarthy, and and, uh, and I was around Bobby Kennedy quite a bit, and, and uh, other people like that who are not are not around. Um, no, I can't. I can't say that I have a good friend that I covered when I was at Life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do have uh, different kinds of love stories going on in your book. You talk about your uh, uh, grandmother. Uh, you talk about um, Sally, and you, you you talk about Lisa, your niece, and uh, th- it really is a very very touching story you've written. Well, thank you so much. I I I've tried to do an honest, entertaining job, and if if you enjoyed it, I think I think I succeeded. You got a Dick Cavett way of talking. Have you ever tell <laughs> Doesn't he sound like Dick Cavett a little bit? Yes. <laughs> Mannerisms. <laughs> do you know? Do you know? We had a photographer who just recently died, and he was one of those guys who took all the underwater pictures here in Florida of the yeah. girls Bruce underwater. Bruce Mozart. Yeah, Bruce Mozart was his name, and I'm just curious if the name rings a bell. And I think Bruce had some pictures that were featured in Life magazine. I think he did. Yes, yes. it does. It, it does certainly does ring a bell. Yes. Hmm. I just go. I just Google it real quick, but I can't tell from what I'm looking at if if it confirms it or not. Well, when you did stories and you had received pictures from different parts of the world, how did you discern that they were true and they weren't um, a fake? Uh, I, did you say you say World War Two? No, about uh, when when you had uh, had to uh, cover events and then there were photographs that were sent to you from uh, overseas where you weren't actually there in the thick of things how did you uh make sure that those photographs were actually telling the real story and they weren't um fabricated well, like like rhode, well, that's a, like that's rhode a, island that's a, using that's iceland right <laughs> yeah, yeah that's an, actually that's a really good question because it was a real it was a real issue but for the most part life worked in teams with a reporter and a photographer and so in in most cases when a life photographer took a picture, there was a reporter there with them uh, who understood that it was his or her responsibility to see to it that the picture was, was, was right. Wow. But I'll give you an example of, of how that can go bad. You, you remember this picture, a very famous picture of a, of a South Vietnamese general shooting uh, a, a Viet Cong prisoner in the yes, head. Yes, yes. Remember that? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that happened, and there was a photographer there who took the picture. But I'm sorry to say that this this kind of thing happened too. The next day, a number of photographers went over there and asked that general to shoot another guy because they missed the picture. Oh. Uh, so you got oh. to. Oh. Yeah. You, 
you got to guard against that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And actually, what the general did, uh, the rest of the story is that he said, okay, and he got a prisoner out, and they took him outside, and he put his gun to the guy's head and pulled the trigger, and it wasn't loaded, and it just clicked, and he, and he laughed at these photographers. Oh, but, uh, oh wow. It, it, wow. Yeah, it, uh, yeah it, it, so uh, knowing what... No, knowing that it that it really happened the way it's being shown, and that it happened, it wasn't reenacted. Was was an important uh, part of every reporter's right. job. Mm. Um, well, I, I don't know if you realize that your life would be so interesting for the rest of us, but it certainly is. Uh, I have a copy of the book. It's called Life Story. If you want the copy that was sent to me, call right now six two two nine six two two, and I'll give it to you. The rest of us have to go buy it, and I, I assume that there's a, a way to do that online. Is it Amazon? And do you have a website, Gerald? I do at Author Gerald Moore, uh, www.authorgeraldmoore.com. Okay. And and the University of New Mexico Press uh, published the book, so it's available there too. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to be with us today. That was uh, an honor to be able to chat with you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Gerald. We'll take a little break. We'll be right back. <laughs> The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. This Monday, times of clouds and sun during the morning hours, then mostly sunny and pleasant in the afternoon with a high of 78 to 82. It'll be mainly clear Monday night and cool, low 51 inland, 59 along the coast. Tuesday will be a nice day with sunshine, high 77 along the coast, 83 inland. Wednesday, partly sunny, the high 75 at the